even if you didn't register, we ordered a ton of food and just getting more people to come, so it should be a good time. Uh, joining us today is our good friend Sina Bahrami. Uh, he's just finishing up his PhD thesis now. Uh, already defended half of it, I guess. Yeah, the departmental one. The departmental one, so we're, we're halfway there. Uh, Sina so will be discussing AV's impacts on uh, parking and congestion, so please join me in welcome Sina. Hello everybody, I'm really happy to present my PhD research on the impacts of autonomous vehicle on parking and congestion. The dream for autonomous vehicle driving, which has started around 50 years ago by photos like this, showing people sitting around the table inside the vehicle, while the vehicle drive on its own is finally becoming true due to the march of technology in the past few years. Autonomous vehicles are going to change how we travel in the near future and will bring some unique future for us. For instance, autonomous vehicles can enhance mobility by providing elderly children and disabled people the ability to drive on their own. Also, autonomous vehicles can increase safety by eliminating human error related accidents, which accounts for 90% of the accident currently. Autonomous vehicles are expected to increase economy and trade by providing 24 7 reliable trading. Although autonomous vehicle technology is very well developed and we see the prototype of autonomous vehicle on some cities around the world, there is still a long lasting debate in terms of autonomous vehicle legislation and policy. Because while some people think that the autonomous vehicle are a cool and safe idea and even travel to those cities to have a ride in the prototype ones, others literally attack autonomous vehicle to postpone the day that we see autonomous vehicle on the street and available in the market. To increase the, to speed up the integration of autonomous vehicle, giant automakers has started thinking of autonomous, uh, has started thinking of, to, oops, okay, not So to increase this, to speed up the integration of autonomous vehicle by society, giant automakers has started thinking of innovative ideas like automated parking facilities. For instance, in 2013, Audi showed that users can get out of their vehicle at the front door of a parking facility, and then using a mobile app to send their vehicle finding a parking spot inside the parking facility. But does anyone have any idea why they choose parking facilities? No. So there are, oh, okay, I said. Control the environment. Exactly, that's one of the things. Anything else? Yeah, so as discussed, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, because parking facility can enable users to gradually experience some of the benefits of the autonomous vehicle, like their self-parking capability. Also, as mentioned by Asmus, because they are a closed environment and installing a few sensors can enable automakers to move the vehicles much faster and smoother inside the parking facility. As, a, as mentioned by Sina, because the parking facility are closed areas and if we ban, for instance, human from entering the parking facility, then we can eliminate the safety issues. But automating the parking facility will going to change the layout of the parking facility. For instance, at the beginning when the passengers do not exist in the vehicle, when the vehicle enters the parking facility, so we do not need the space between the vehicle to open the door to let the passenger get in and out of the vehicle and we can park vehicles much closer and tighter together because we do not need that in space for opening the doors. Also, because the vehicle can be relocated in a driverless mode, we can stack them behind each other and then relocate them whenever it is necessary in driverless mode to increase the utilization of the land. So, in the first chapter of my thesis, we look into the optimal layout design of such parking facility. By optimal layout design, we mean that if we know that dimension of the parking facility and also the demand for the parking, how many vehicles should be stacked behind each other to minimize the number of the location. So the decision variable of our model is to find the size of these islands. And the, the, these islands are going to be separated from each other by some inter-island gaps. Those inter-island gaps are necessary to make sure that any vehicle is able to leave the parking facility at any given point of time, like the conventional parking facility. For instance, if the green vehicle would like to leave, which is blocked by the two red vehicles, we can relocate the two red ones to the inter-island gap. They wait there till the green vehicle leave the parking facility, and then they can come back to the previous position and park there. So if the size of the parking facility increases, then the islands increases, then we need larger inter-island gaps to store more vehicles which block 
any other view. We, we model this problem using queuing term. We, use, we define each stack of an island as a queue, and then by using queuing theory, we can find the probability for different queue sizes. For each queue size, we can calculate the number of relocation movements. Multiply these two terms and sum it over all stacks in all islands, we give us the expected number of relocation, which we are interested to minimize. As you can see, this objective function is a nonlinear objective function, and the resulting model would be a mixed integer program with a nonlinear objective function, which is empty part and cannot be solved directly by commercial solvers. To solve the problem, we use vendors decomposition and decompose the problem to a master problem which is purely integer and generate different island sizes and the sub-problem which is a purely linear with a non-linear objective function and assign the demand to, the, to these generated islands. The two problems are solved iteratively until we find the optimal layout of the partners. When we had the solution algorithm, we start to perform some sensitivity analysis. For instance, we, at the beginning, we're looking to see how demand is going to change the layout of the parking lot. As you can see on the top, when the demand is low, the parking layout will look like a conventional parking facility. All layouts are two row, and no vehicle is going to block any other vehicle, and we do not need any relocation movement. But when the demand increases, we will see the formation of larger islands in the middle row. And usually when the parking facility reaches to its capacity, we have one or two very large islands, but it makes us to do a lot of more relocation to, for instance, let every vehicle leave the parking facility. Then we we'll also look into the impact of shape of parking facility on the layout of the parking. So in all these graphs, the total area is fixed, and we change the length and width of the rectangle to see how it impacted the total capacity. As we can see, the, the square shape is always going to provide the highest capacity. But also we find that if we park parallel to the length of a rectangle, it's going to provide more capacity rather than parking parallel to the width of a uh, rectangle. We also were interested to see if we convert the parking facility to an automated parking facility, how many more spots we can provide by this conversion. We analyze for different uh, parking sizes and we find that on average, the converting a parking facility to an automated parking facility can increase its capacity by 60%. It means that if we automated the parking facility, we can decrease the land which is needed for parking, and it can revitalize a lot of valuable land which is currently used for parking. The previous model was a macroscopic model and only give us the layout of the parking facility. It doesn't give us any information about which spot we should park any vehicle. For instance, in this graph, if the numbers show the departure time of the vehicle, by raising your hands, how many of you think that we should park the green vehicle on spot number one? And the numbers showing the departure time of the vehicle. How about the spot number two? And what about the spot number three? As we can see, because the, the, these numbers show the departure time, if we, for instance, park the green vehicle in the spot number, T, number three, then we do not need any relocation movement. Because, for instance, the green vehicle can leave at four o'clock, then the vehicle behind it is going to leave at five, and the last vehicle is going to leave at six o'clock. And we do not need to do any relocation movement. So, by knowing the arrival and departure time of the vehicles, maybe we can arrange them inside the parking facility to avoid any blockage and relocation move. In the next chapter of my thesis, we'll look into this problem and see how we can use the arrival and departure information of the vehicles. We define two different scenarios. The first scenario, which we call it full information, we assume that we know the arrival and departure time of all vehicles in advance, and we model this as an integer program. For instance, for a a small parking facility with 12 spots, if the arrival and departure time of the vehicle is listed as in the first line, then the model will give us which spot we should park the vehicles and how we should, for instance, let them retrieve them when they are summoned by their users. As you can see, this model considers both direction arrival to the spot and both direction also retrieving from the parking facility. But there are two problems with this model. First of all, the problem cannot be solved in a reasonable amount of time for real-sized parking facility with hundreds of stops. Also, it is very unrealistic to have such information about the arrival and departure time of all vehicles in advance. 
So it motivates us to consider another scenario, which we call partial information. In the partial information scenario, we assume that we know the arrival rate to the parking facility, and each vehicle is going to declare its dual time at the time of entrance to the parking facility. But its dual time is going to follow exponential distribution. This scenario can be modeled as a stochastic differential optimization model, but because the dual time of the vehicle is going to follow exponential distribution, the number of feasible state is infinite because the, they can live at any time and but with different probabilities. So the problem cannot be solved to the global optimum, but we can make a simulation model of the parking facility and test different policies or rule of thumb to see how we should allocate the, park, the vehicles to different spots. We define three different groups of policies. The first group of policies, which we call arrival time, just only consider the arrival time of the vehicle and try to assign the vehicles to the deepest available spot. The second group, which we call clustering, are going to group the vehicle based on their dual time. For instance, if they are going to stay in the parking for a short period of time or long period of time, and then allocate them to different locations inside the parking facility to different islands to avoid the blockage. The last group of policies, which are blockage probability, are going to calculate the blockage probability based on the dual time that we know about the vehicle and the vehicles which are currently inside the parking and allocate the spot with the lowest blockage probability. When we run our model, we find that the blockage probability uh, policies usually outperform the other ones when the arrival rate to the parking facility is high or all islands are large, larger than four row islands. But we find when we have two row islands like a conventional parking facility, then the arrival time policies are going to perform better. We also find that retrieving vehicle from rear side does not change the number of relocation. What we mean by retrieving from the rear side would be more clear by this example. In this example, if you would like to retrieve the green vehicle again, it's blocked by two red vehicles in front of you. And if we only consider the retrieving from the front, then we need to relocate two red vehicles in front of you. But if we consider also the retrieving from the back, only because there is one vehicle behind it, then we can save the number of relocation and decrease the number of relocation. But when we run our model, we find that because that is spot which is, which, which is going to be empty after the green vehicle leaves the parking would be available, and another vehicle is going to be parked there, it's going to nullify the impacts of the retrieving from the rear side. Autonomous vehicles not only change how we park, but also they are able to change where we park. Currently, when we travel from an origin to a destination, we start searching for parking when we get close to the final destination. The statistic shows that people on average spend around 20 minutes in search of a parking spot in large metropolitan areas. These people who search for parking are a big challenge for policymakers. For instance, the studies show that these people who search for parking are accountable for 13% of congestion in major roads. Autonomous vehicle can eliminate the hassles of finding parking spot from the user because the user is able to drive from the origin to the final destination, get out of their vehicle at that point, and then let, let the vehicle to find the parking spot on its own. But on the other hand, they are going to increase the challenges of the policy makers because the autonomous vehicle have more options. For instance, the, the user can send the vehicle to a further parking facility because they are not inside the vehicle when the vehicle is going to search for parking. Also, they have the option of, for instance, cruising around the destination while the user doing its activity. So they are going to increase the challenges of the policymaker and we were interested to see how they are going to choose the parking. We consider three different options for autonomous vehicle as their parking option. We define them as home or any free parking facility. The second option is a paid parking facility, and the last one is cruising instead of parking. We can calculate the cost associated with each of these options. For instance, if a user's home is located X hour from the destination, and the cost of driving be C dollar per hour, the total cost of choosing home as parking would be two times X times C. The number two accounts for the round trip from the destination to home, and then later come back to pick up the user. Similarly, we can calculate the cost of choosing a parking facility. Again, the first term is the cost, travel cost from the destination to the parking facility, and the second term is the money that the user has to pay to the parking facility to use them. 
And the last option is does only have the travel cost, and the vehicle is going to travel for the whole activity time of the user. The first two options are only feasible if the round trip from the destination to home and then coming back, for instance, to pick up the user takes less time than the activity time of the user. The travel time depends on the congestion. And congestion depends on the decision of all other users. For instance, if everybody try to cruise instead of parking, the network will become congested. And even if you would like to send your vehicle to home or parking facility, maybe you are not able to do that because of the congestion and you cannot get your vehicle on time when you want to leave the destination. To model this interrelated relationship, we use an agent-based simulation model. We started with a hypothetical city to a little bit have sense about what's happening and also perform some sensitivity analysis before we move into a real size network. In this grid-based network, we assume that the population decreases gradually as we go further from the center and also we assume at the beginning that there is a parking facility at each point. When we run our model in the graph B here, we see that on top right, we will see that the number of people who are going to cruise when the travel cost is $12 per hour and the parking cost is $3 per hour is zero. No one is going to cruise when there is such difference between the driving cost and the parking cost and there is available parking. On the other hand, we, uh, below that, we, we will see that the, most of people are going to use their home as parking place, as the parking option. Because this city is very small and everybody can reach to their home very fast, then most of users are going to, sh to choose the home as parking facility. This graph, graph C, shows the number of people who are going to, ch to choose parking facility. Those people who have a short activity time and cannot, for instance, send their vehicle to home are going to choose the parking facility. Then we perform analysis on the cost of the parking. So these graphs all show the number of people who are going to choose parking facilities for different parking costs. As we can see, when the parking cost is zero, which means that the parking is free, everybody is going to use the parking facility at their destination, and it makes sense because it's just next to their destination point that it is free. But when the parking cost starts to increase, we will see that the people who are going to use parking will decrease. And when the parking cost reach to the travel cost, the number of people who are going to use parking facility are going to be zero. Then we can perform the same, the same, same sensitivity analysis on the driving cost. In all these photos, again, we show the number of people who are going to choose parking for different travel costs. Because the travel cost can change based on the fuel cost or the electrification of the vehicle or if we have the, the tolling system. So again, we will see that then the driving cost decreases and get goes to the parking cost, when for instance the driving cost is $4 per hour, then the number of people who are going to choose parking would go towards zero. And as the driving cost will increase, we will see more people are going to choose parking. Up to this point, we assume that we have a parking facility at any point. But we can relax that assumption and see how the location of the parking facility is going to impact the result. So we relax that assumption and at the beginning we assume that we have only four parking facilities at the four corners and this graph shows the number of people who are going to cruise and their, dis their distribution in over the city. As we can see in the corners where the parking facilities are located, no one is going to cruise and the number of cruising people on the four corners are zero where the parking facilities are located. And as we get further from the corner and go toward the center, we will see more people who are cruising instead of parking. This graph, on the other hand, shows the number and also the geographical distribution of people who are going to send their vehicle to the parking facilities. Because the parking facilities are located on the four corners, those who, live, those who are in the center of the city and they are far from the parking facility are not going to send their vehicle to the parking facility. But as we get closer to the corners and far from the center, we will see more people are going to send their vehicle to the parking facility. With having a little bit of uh, sense about what's happening in a, this hypothetical city, we move into a, cases, a real case study. We choose downtown Toronto and we got some data from a GTA model and we started to perform our uh, model and see what's happening over there. 
At the beginning, we keep everything as it is, and for instance, we do not change the cost of parking, and we assume that all trips that are going to, be, to downtown are going to be done by autonomous vehicle. When we run our model, we find that people are going to cruise up to 18. But the other thing that we find is that people are going to send their vehicle in search of a cheaper parking facility up to 47 minutes in this study. It means that they are, and we also find that, for instance, the parking facility we charge $2 per hour and located in Sherburne and Dundas is heavily used by users because they all are interested in that parking. And because they are not inside the vehicle, they can send their vehicle to that location. On the other hand, we find that the parking facilities, which are $11 per hour, and they are located in the core downtown area in Bay and King, are not used at all. So we thought that if we have the same parking price in the whole area, then we can motivate people to send the, to use the parking facility which is closer to their destination, and it can decrease the total VKT in the area and the congestion. So we apply the same parking price to all parking facilities in the study area, and the same parking price was the average of the, the cost in, in the cost of parking in the area. When we per do that, we find that people are going to cruise for a longer period of time, and also the number of people who are going to cruise will increase. These people who are going to cruise, and for longer time they are cruising, will cause more congestion, and the network will, will become more congested. As a result, we will see, for instance, 1% increase in the total VKT in the area. Also, we find that by applying such policy, although people are going to choose the parking facility which is closer in terms of distance to their destination, but because the network becomes more congested, the vehicle is going to travel for longer time inside the, inside the network. So we find that these policies may not be that helpful because we, we are interested to decrease the total VKT in the area. So instead of having the same parking price, we return the cost of the parking to what it was before and apply a zero occupant code. So if vehicles are going to travel free without any user inside it in search of a parking, then they are charged quite some amount of money. We find that if we apply such policy, then we can motivate people to make a balance between the location of the parking and also the cost of travel. We saw that under this scenario, all parking facilities in the service area are going to be used by users, and we will see a, de a marginal decrease in the maximum cruising time and also the maximum travel time to the parking facility, but at the end we will see a 3.5% decrease in the total VKT in the end. Autonomous vehicles also have the connectivity feature. They can communicate with each other and also with the infrastructure. This connectivity feature enables them to follow each other with a smaller car following gap. This smaller car following gap can be interpreted as an increase in the capacity. But the amount that the capacity of a link increases depends on the number of autonomous vehicles inside the traffic flow. For instance, when the number of autonomous vehicles is less, then they can form very uh, uh, small platoons and the increase in the capacity would be marginal. But when the most of the flow would become autonomous vehicle, then they can form larger plateaus and we will see a, a great increase in the capacity of the network and the links. We were interested to study how the equilibrium condition and equilibrium flow will change when the capacity of a link is a function of the proportion of AVs inside the link. We model the equilibrium condition by uh, using a nonlinear complementarity problem. And when we study the problem, we find that there are multiple flows which satisfy the equilibrium condition. Which means that we have multiple flows that are going to be equilibrated and they have the same, but they don't have the same performance. So we, start, we started to study the properties of these different equilibrium flows and try to see what is their characteristic. We started with a very simple example with, uh, of a network with two nodes and two identical links. We generated all uh, equilibrium flows, and as a measure of performance of traffic, we found the total network travel. In these graphs, on x and y axis, we showed the proportion of AVs under different equilibrium flows, and z axis shows the total network travel time. As you can see, the performance of the network under all these equilibrium flows are not equal. So, and also we will see that the best, for instance, user with the best user equilibrium, which gives us the minimum total network travel time, will happen at the two ends of the graph. 
which are associated with the AV proportion of zero and one leak, which means that one leak is going to be used by only human driven vehicle and there's no AV on that link. And the other one has an AV proportion of 0.8, which means that the other link is going to be shared between the two modes. Then we change the demand and again generate all the equilibrium flows and start this, do the same process. As you can see, the shape of the function change, and all, again, we will see different performance of the dif different equilibrium flows. Again, we will see that the best user equilibrium will happen at the two ends, which are associated with the AV proportion of one in one link. AV proportion of one means that the link is only used by autonomous vehicle, and the other one has an AV proportion of near 0.2, which is shared between the two modes. Then instead of changing the total in, in the demand combination, we fix the total demand and change the penetration of AV in the total demand. And also instead of plotting, for instance, all the user equilibrium, we only look into the best user equilibrium in terms of total network travel time. In this graph on the x-axis, we show the AV penetration rate in the total demand, and the y-axis sh shows the AV proportion on the two links under the best user equilibrium. As you can see, when the AV penetration rate is low, under the best user equilibrium, one of the link has an AV proportion of zero. It means that the link is only used by human-driven vehicle and AV is not going into that. While the other one has an AV proportion between zero and one, which means that it is shared between the two nodes. When the AV penetration rate in the total demand increases, we will see for a small interval, we have a complete segregation between the two modes. The AV proportion in one link is zero. It means that the link is only used by human driven. The other one has an AV proportion of one. The, the other link means that it's only used by AVs. Then when the AV penetration rate increases <coughs> even further, we will see that the other link has start to have some AV proportion and goes to be shared. And finally, when the most of demand are autonomous vehicles, the best user equilibrium happens when both links are going to be shared between the two. This simple example and some other similar example give us the idea that under the best user equilibrium, some of the links are AV exclusive or some of the other ones are HV exclusive or human driven exclusive. But we cannot solve the best user equilibrium problem for real size network. Also, for a network with A links, we cannot generate all these different scenarios because it's impossible to generate all those uh, different scenarios and test the user equilibrium under each of these conditions. So we use a heuristic algorithm to find the local optimum for the best user equilibrium. But to test how good our objective function is and how close we are to the global optimum, we you choose the system optimal objective function. Because we know that the system optimal is going to have the best performance and the total network travel time is minimum under the system optimal condition. And also we know that the idea behind any, for instance, traffic policy is to close the gap between the user equilibrium and system optimal. When we perform our model for a real size network, we find that if we apply such policies to a few things, we, the gap between the system optimal and user equilibrium will decrease to less than 1%. It means that if we, for instance, choose some of the links in the network and make them AV exclusive or HV exclusive and let people choose their route selfishly as they do under the user equilibrium, then the resulting flow and the resulting condition in the network would be very close to the, to, to the system optimal which we are very interested to see. To review my thesis, we, look, we started with the optimal design for the parking facilities and we tried to find the optimal layout of such parking facilities. Then we add the arrival and departure information of individual to the optimal layout and try to figure out the optimal operation of such parking facilities. If we know the schedule of the users and also we can add the location and cost of different parking options, then we can have an idea about their parking choice. And if, when we see how they are going to choose parking and their impact in the network, then we can propose some policies to increase their advantages that we can get from autonomous vehicle and also decrease the externalities of autonomous vehicle. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions. So, 
one of the things that I'm particularly intrigued about on the policy front of AC, ACs, ABs, is that they make policy enforcement in general a lot easier, in theory, because they're all connected. Um, and so, have you looked into dynamic parking pricing at all, and how that would impact parking choice? No, we did not look into the dynamic pricing of the parking, but I agree that they are enabling us to make some, you know, apply some uh, control policies. So for that reason, for instance, we have the tolling for the zero occupant. I think that's not possible for us very easily to apply. Currently, for instance, even the, for HOV length, it's not very easy and uh, very uh, easy to apply it currently. But with the data that we will have on the era of autonomous vehicle, it will be much easier and we can apply such policy. Yes. Um, in terms of the, uh, the AVs and the parking, I think it should be an option that like, you have to think of the variable that people are going to like loan their AV vehicle to Uber or Lyft and the, the car will actually travel the streets and maybe even make you some money during the day. So that's a variable you can't, that's going to happen. It's got to happen, otherwise the whole aspect of AVs doesn't fulfill its potential. The, the parking scenarios seem very two-dimensional. And I say this because most parking lots are have levels. So you have to factor that into that math as well because it takes time to get up and down the levels. So I think it's important those models of how the cars will stack up and pack up have to include a, a three-dimensional aspect to it. So I, I thought that was a little two-dimensional. That was thank you. For the first question, I totally agree with you that autonomous vehicles are going to increase the sharing economy and we will see more sharing between the users. But the reason that we do not consider that was we are not, we do not have any data about it, and also we do not, for instance, how much of people are going to share their vehicle with the other ones and how they are going to share. Is it, for instance, still the services like Uber, or for instance, they are going to make a group of people and they share it between themselves. Also, for the multi-dimensional parking, we look into the layout for each level. So if it is multi-level, still we can have those layouts. So in each layout, in each uh, level, we can have a different layouts, and the model can consider those things as well. I'll just give you a, a real life example of that. If you go to any level parking lot, the ground level occupies first. Right? If you want to find a spot right away, just go to the top. It's all bent. So that because of the time that you're walking up and down the other, whatever. But the, the AV vehicle won't have a driver, but it'll still take time to get up there, and time's part of the equation of parking on this. So, thank you, though. It's very, very simple. Thank you. Hi, Thank you both for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Um, I can you just give me a detailed description about how could you just solve the first model? Because you just mentioned that you separate into a main problem and a sub problem, and you solve it iteratively. But I don't uh, quite understand what, how do you just solve the model in an iterative way. Okay, so the model, in, the decision variable in that model was the size of the island, mm -hmm. which is an integer variable because the, not, the size of the island cannot be, for instance, I don't know, two and a half. It should be two or three. And also, when we generate an island, we are going to assign a demand to it. When, for instance, the island is, size of the island is two, then we are going to assign two vehicles to that. Okay? And the demand, should, the demand that we are going to assign to that parking size should be less than the size of the island. Okay? So it, can, it, should, it can be any value between zero to two. Then, so we, we have a model which is a mixed integer program. The size of the islands are the, the integer variables, and the demand that we are going to allocate to each island is a linear, a linear decision variable. So we dis divide the model to two separate programs. The first model just generate different island sizes. And the second problem, which is the sub problem, is going to assign demand to the generated islands. In the second problem, we assume that we know the size of the islands. Now we're going to assign the demand to the islands that we generated. So these two problems are going to be solved, and then we use the, their 
the Lagrangian multiplier as a vendor's cut <coughs> and bring it to the master problem, for instance, when we assign the demand to the generator layouts, we bring that as a vendor's cut to the master problem and again generate another series of layouts. Uh, okay. So can I ask, uh, could you just guarantee the solution is optimal? I mean, produced by this process? You know, the vendors, the composition can generate the global optimal solution. When the gap between the master problem and the sub problem is... So what, what's the gap to you set? We set the gap as zero. Zero? Yeah. Okay. But it takes very long time to solve. So we have also a statistic <coughs> algorithm like that. Can I ask uh, how much time will it take for this iteration? Depend on the size of the parking and also demand. We have, for instance, the, the, the solution which takes like five, six hours okay. to be generated. Okay. Just another question. I think the objective function is nonlinear, right? Doesn't it violate anything? The, yeah, only the objective function was nonlinear, but we can show that the objective function is still complex. Mm -hmm. So we still can benefit from the, those methodology for the complex solution. And it doesn't, for instance, impact the master problem, which is purely a teacher. But the master problem objective function is nonlinear. So. No, it's just the objective function of the master problem is the cut that we have from the uh, sub okay. If there is no further question, I would like to make some acknowledgments. First of all, I would like to thank Mehdi Nurineja, my friend, because the idea for the parking data problem is proposed by him. Also, I would like to thank Eric and James for providing the GTA model data for the downtown Toronto. And most importantly, I would like to thank Matt Rurda, my supervisor, for his support and also insight during my history.